Hi there, my name is Alex Lutsch. I'm with the World Bank Group and I work for the Forest Carbon Partnership Facility and I'll be presenting to you a framework for building national forest monitoring systems for RED+. Plus. This is of course a module uh, in a series of learning modules that was developed jointly by the FCPF, the Forest Carbon Partnership Facility, with Govsi Gold, the Global Observation of Forest and Land Cover Dynamics and Wacheningen University. I'll be narrating these slides and this lecture and walk you through a couple of uh, elements here. But the module developers are shown here on this title slide and they include Mar uh, Erika Rumain, Martin Herold and Priest Mora from Wacheningen University. After you are done, hopefully you will have learned something useful and you will understand the needs and priorities of a national Red Plus policy and implementation strategy. You will hopefully have some knowledge about how to assess and characterize current forest monitoring and reporting capacities based on your country's circumstances. And lastly, you will also have the ability to develop a roadmap for building sustained in-country capacities for Red Plus MRV. Now here's some background material that you can perhaps study at your own leisure. Uh, there are hyperlinks to pertinent decisions by the uh, UNFCCC, the Climate Change Convention, as well as other materials that you will be able to find online that are the basis for this module and that provide additional detail. And here are more literature resources, again with hyperlinks or links to the resources online where you can download the underlying document. Now, I will principally touch on five main components in this lecture. The first one has to do with requirements set by the UNFCCC, the Climate Change Convention on National Forest Monitoring or NFMS, as I will probably refer to it throughout this lecture, for measuring, reporting, and verification, or MRV. And that is, of course, for Red Plus activities, so activities related to the reduction of emissions from forest deforestation, forest degradation, and the enhancement of forest carbon stocks. That's part one. Part two will focus on the development of a framework for national forest monitoring system. The third part will focus on the building of technical and institutional capacity to implement this NFMS and perform the function of Red Plus measuring, reporting and verification. Part 4 will focus on planning and implementation of these activities. And the last part will focus on cost implications and what it might take in terms of resources to develop the necessary capacities to effectively perform Red Plus MRV. Now let's dive right in into uh, portion one, section one of this lecture, which focuses on unit triple C requirements in relation to forest forest monitoring systems and Red Plus MRV. Now, as you will have picked up already or know already, uh, MRV stands for Measuring, Reporting and Verification and that's an important set of steps required for countries or jurisdictions or other entities to receive payments for verified results arising from the implementation of Red Plus activities. And the National Forest Monitoring System of course needs to perform these functions effectively in order to be able to mobilize these type of payments for countries. Naturally, you also need to have a benchmark, a baseline, or a reference to compare future emissions related to forests compared to past emissions, and that's of course the forest reference emission level or forest reference level that uh, serves as this benchmark uh, to implement the to establish the performance of the implementation of red activities in a particular part of a country or country overall and uh, how they're assessed in the greenhouse gas inventory of that country. Now to do this effectively you need to have a robust and transparent national forest monitors, monitoring system that allows you to estimate emissions over time in a consistent fashion and allows you to compare these emissions in the future to compare to, uh, to a reference level that you established at the beginning of the process.
And of course, these reported emissions, in most circumstances, will undergo a technical assessment by experts before any payments are made. These are the principal steps that apply generally and are basically provided by the UNIF C and the respective decisions made by the conference of the parties to that effect. Now a few words on the mod modalities for national forest monitoring systems. So the full implementation of a uh, results-based action on Red Plus requires a national forest monitoring system. There you see the respective decision by the conference of parties under the Climate Change Convention that established that. A national forest monitoring system can also be focusing on a portion of the country as an interim step. In fact, many of the countries that are currently working with the facilities that uh, facility that I'm affiliated with at the moment, the Forest Carbon Partnership Facility, they all almost all work on subnational jurisdictions, so a cluster of states or provinces as they build the capacity and implement a forest monitoring system, but of course with the idea to scale that up to the national level at some point. But in any case, um, it is good practice to build that system that is being developed on existing systems. Very few countries, if any, start from scratch when they develop their national forest monitoring system, so building on existing systems and capacity is sensical, of course, in that context. It is also important to um, enable the assessment of different types of forests within the country. Oftentimes they are affected differentially by different uh, pressures, including natural forests. And the system should also be flexible and allow for improvement over time. Rarely you design a perfect system the first time and you will find room for improvement as you apply it and you can improve over time, of course. And that's, of course, the principal idea in the phased approach that underlies Red Plus overall. Moving from readiness to testing to a full implementation, uh, that applies to the implementation and the development of the National Forest Monitoring System as well. Now, on the specific guidance that has been provided by the UNFCCC on methodology, here are some important points. What uh, has been stated is that a combination of remote sensing approaches and ground-based forest carbon inventories uh, should be used. That makes sense. Remote sensing gives you observations from space or from airplanes that can cover large areas efficiently. And ground-based information gives you from inventories gives you very detailed and accurate information that is measured by people and with devices on the ground. It's also important that the methodology that's being used uh, allows estimates to be transparently developed, that they're consistent over time and comparable, and to the extent possible uh, that they're accurate, so reflecting reality on the ground, and reduce uncertainties, statistical uncertainties in, in, in the estimate. So, uh, and that, of course, needs to reflect the national cap uh, capabilities and capacities that exist in a country. And very importantly, and that's the third bullet here, these uh, estimates that are produced by the National Forest Monitoring System should be transparent and should be made available and suitable for review and assessment by independent uh, experts, for instance. So those were some key points on the guidance provided from the UN Climate Change Convention with respect to methodology and the role of National Forest Monitoring Systems in the context of Red Plus and the respective payments. Now in the second portion of this lecture, I will focus on the general broad framework of this National Forest Monitoring System. And of course, many of the other lecturers will focus on detailed elements of this framework and I hope you have an opportunity to check out some of these lectures as well. So moving on then into the second part of the presentation. So it's important to know that the National Forest Monitoring System has multiple functions. One set of functions you might describe as general monitoring functions.
So for instance, focusing on the assessment of um, forest extent, uh, you monitor maybe natural resources more generally and present respective information through an internet uh, interface. There may be also a monitoring function performed by communities on the ground that, uh, for instance, community forest user groups that monitor their um, forest resources in situ. And there may be other forest monitoring systems um, related to forests that are already in place. So these may be general monitoring functions that allow the assessment of forest properties more generally beyond carbon and they should be harmonized to the extent possible with the specific functions that need to be designed into this system to perform the measuring, measuring, reporting and verification function. And that's what's shown here in the colored boxes in this graphic. This uh, usually entails the use of a satellite monitoring system or also airborne observations but also observations collected uh, through a national forest inventory and the more general greenhouse gas inventory of the, of the country. So there's multiple functions associated with this forest monitoring uh, system. Some of them are generic and serve a broader purpose and some of them are specific, focusing specifically on MRV for Red Plus. So this is uh, just uh, re stating in a bit more detail what I just uh, said, that there is for uh, countries, there is obviously more utility of a national forest monitoring system other than monitoring carbon. So keeping track of forest area in general or planted trees or ecosystems in the country, that often is related to the monitoring of water resources or also sometimes also water quality or it can be used for biodiversity conservation or land rights. So again, it's just to stress the main point here, it sometimes it gets forget, forgotten in the, when you're in the weeds of things and uh, in, in the practice of working on your MRV that MRV is, is only one of several functions that a national forest monitoring system needs to be able to perform. And it's important to not to lose track of that broader functionality of that system. Now what this graph shows you is a bit of a timeline of how this work has evolved or is evolving in, in a number of countries around the world now, or as many countries have or have had for some time in some kind of a national forest monitoring system. They also have a national greenhouse gas inventory in place and have used that inventory to report to the Climate Change Convention. And on top of that, a number of initiatives have now supported a number of countries to develop specific MRV functionality and the development of a national forest monitoring system that can also perform the MRV functions for, for Red Plus. And that's sort of what you see as you go from left to right in this, uh, in this graph, that as Red Plus became a major policy direction in many countries, there was an important thrust on the development of a national strategy and its implementation. There were many pilots to local red plus monitoring to, to monitor red plus at the local level, so for instance with communities at the watershed level or for districts within a country to test and develop the concept of red plus. And then of course many countries are also receiving support on MRV for red plus actions specifically. So all these things are being phased in and ultimately in the future, and that's what's shown on the right part of this graph, would feed into a national system and perhaps at that interim level um, at a sub-national system to allow the assessment and quantification of emissions in the future and report them transparently so that they can also be assessed independently through a technical assessment. So all these things sort of come together in most uh, countries over time and the additional MRV functions are layered on top or built into any existing monitoring systems that the country or jurisdiction within the country may have in place, including the greenhouse gas uh, inventory. Remote sensing, of course, has become a very important tool in the context of the development of national forest monitoring systems.
And when I say remote sensing, I mean both uh, data collected by sensors, flown and satellites, but that can also include information collected by sensors flown on airplanes. Now, remote sensing is uh, very useful because data has been collected for a number of years, a number of decades now, and there's data in archives that allows countries to construct historical baselines or forest reference uh, emission levels for the purpose of uh, RED+. Plus. And this kind of data has become readily available and different kinds of data different kinds of resolution with different kinds of quality is now available and going forward to help countries track forest in the future and that is of course an essential element to estimate emissions in the future. The principal use of remote sensing is to estimate forest area changes over time. It's in fact the principal source in most circumstances to, to measure this particular variable, forest area change. It's also very useful and there's increasingly sophisticated and useful approaches out there to estimate the degradation of forests, so areas that remain forests without degrading in their carbon or other uh, functionality. And oftentimes the observation of forest cover change or land use change over time using remote sensing is also an important diagnostic tool and analytical tool to understand the driving forces behind changes in, in forest area and forest quality. While remote sensing is a very powerful tool for RED plus MRV, there's also limitations and important challenges and these are shown here. And I'd just like to point out uh, four important factors that uh, represent some challenges. Uh, the one has to do with the cloud cover, which is typical in many tropical and subtropical regions, so especially optical sensors have a hard time um, then seeing the land surface that is meant to be observed. Also the seasonality in both cloud cover but also in vegetation or forest uh, dynamics impacts the observations. Uh, topography, uh, forests that grow on steep mountain slopes are more difficult to see than those in, in the lowlands or flatlands and, uh, and there needs to be uh, corrective activities to, to make the data useful for observations in um, mountainous areas. And also remote sensing data is usually voluminous in terms of data storage and uh, there may be some limitations and challenges to get to the data using the internet constraints uh, for instance by the download speed available in some countries. Now without dwelling on any of the details here, uh, you can read for yourself, there's you know, practical solutions that have been found to address some of these challenges, whether that has to do with uh, the fusion of different kinds of remote sensing data to address the cloud um, cover challenge, or software approaches, software-based approaches embedded in many of commercially available software packages to address uh, auto uh, rectification and topographic uh, corrections. So those were the key points on the framework for national forest monitoring systems. Now let me focus on some important technical institutional capacity building activities for forest monitoring and RIP plus MRV. There are different sets of requirements that have a bearing on the development of a national forest monitoring system and to the respective uh, development of uh, capacities. They can come from international sources but also uh, from, from national uh, contexts. Internationally, it is of course the decision, decisions of the Conference of Parties on the Climate uh, Change Convention that has, for instance, stipulated that important requirement is to be complying with IPCC good practice guidance and you see uh, an asterisk here that guides you to another module as part of this set of uh, lectures it gives you a lot more information about this particular point about these requirements but of course the national framework also stipulates important design requirements for national forest monitoring system depending on what the priorities of the national policies are on red plus or the implementation strategy. Now at the beginning of the process as these requirements are understood is the development of a capacity building plan 
and uh, that begins with an assessment of existing forest monitoring capacities within the country relative to the requirements stipulated either internationally or nationally, and then the development of a, an eventual implementation of a roadmap, which is effectively a sustained in-country capacity building plan for MRV that allows countries to meet international and national requirements in the future. Now, as the capacities, technical capacities are assessed at the beginning of, of this design and capacity building process, a number of factors need to be considered, and they're listed here. So, of course, there's the requirements from uh, the IPCC good factors guidance that I just referred to. There is the existing national capacities um, that do exist in many countries uh, on for national forest monitoring systems. Rarely countries start from scratch. There's also usually efforts to improve the greenhouse gas inventory capacity to estimate greenhouse gas emissions more generally, including REP plus. And uh, the REP plus specific activities would, of course, inform that process. And again, you see here a reference to the Global Forest Observation Initiatives, GFYs, method methodological guidance and documentation which uh, describes how you can do this in more detail. Fourth, there's also specific red plus particular characteristics uh, that, may, that may be featured in the country. So a number of countries are characterized by forest fires. That is very difficult to, to monitor. So if that is an important driver for emissions, that has some bearings on the development of the national forest monitoring systems and how you perform uh, uh, MRV. And there may be specific technical challenges uh, such as persistent cloud cover or seasonality or the availability of data for a particular region of, uh, of interest. So these are all factors, or five principal factors, that uh, feed into the assessment of existing forest monitoring capacities. And that those are important points to consider as you develop a, a, a roadmap. Just to illustrate a little bit, um, how the picture presented itself a couple of years ago and was documented in this um, cited uh, presentation or uh, publication by Erica Romain. You see a global map with countries in dark colors um, relating to relatively large capacity gaps and colors shown in uh, lighter yellows that have uh, smaller capacity gaps and capacity building needs. And that has probably changed over the years, as many of these countries have received support. And that's in fact what, what is shown in this uh, second slide here, that many of these countries are engaged in one or several Red Plus capacity building initiatives. So you can see how well the subtropical and tropical countries are covered by support. And uh, you will obviously see where uh, several countries are that have relatively large capacity building gaps, but currently no support from any of the multilateral or bilateral initiatives on, on Red Plus. Now, as the capacity in countries is built on the technical side as well as on the institutional side, the technology transfer from one country to another becomes very uh, important. And it's also important to consider then, as this transfer and this capacity building takes place, that each country is unique in many ways. Um, so the, the, the tra transfer and the focus should be on, for instance, the specific forest types that characterize the country, also institutional arrangements that are appropriate for that country, the importance of forests within the economy, for instance, or culture. And of course, you want to focus Red plus on the key drivers of deforestation or forest degradation and, and accordingly develop a monitoring system that allows you to track these and um, address these as effectively as possible. Now, as you're listening to this presentation, you're probably familiar with the phased approach that was agreed 
to characterize as the capacity building in many countries for Red Plus. Uh, so you would be doing different things on Red Plus MRV and development of the forest monitoring system depending where you find yourselves in these uh, three phases. So in the so-called readiness phase, the initial capacity building phase, where countries develop national strategies or action plans or develop policies, um, including uh, measures and policies um, for capacity building. That's where the specific MRV activities shown in the right hand, right hand column would probably focus on basic capacity development needs, uh, the assessment of those needs, and the development of a roadmap. As countries move further into the implementation and the implementation of Red Plus, as well as the capacity building, um, the focus on MRB would be more on demonstrating how the system can or could work and starting to, to, to use it to derive uh, useful policy relevant uh, information. And of course, the ultimate idea would be to have a full implementation of both the Red Plus set of policies in a country across either the a major jurisdiction or major jurisdictions or the entire country. And here, of course, the MRV system needs to be able to establish national performance of, uh, of those, the effectiveness of those policies and be fully operational in order to um, establish the performance of, um, of Red Plus with respect to greenhouse gas mitigation. Now there's a lot of work happening internationally and in many countries in relation to MRV and coordination becomes very important in order to have everyone focused on, on the key tasks. Internationally, what has happened a lot, and I'm sure you as a listener to this presentation have benefited from this, uh, is South-South cooperation. That's usually often a very useful way of bringing up the capacity as countries learn from each other, countries in similar situations learn from each other and share experiences and solutions that are appropriate for the particular circumstance. And of course many donors are supporting agencies or organizations in countries on Red Plus MRV. And there's the broader technical community, also the research community that is providing uh, guidance. So a lot of the material that you find in these, this lecture as well as the other lectures uh, comes from this uh, technical community as well. Countries are also, of course, developing national strategies and invest in MRV capacity de development. And an important step here is the development of an MRV roadmap that responds to the policy priorities. It's also important consider the institutional setup for MRV. It's often forgotten, but very essential, and I will speak about this in a, in a moment. And it's also important to establish multi-sector partnerships to, uh, to do this uh, effectively. And that would, of course, allow countries to, to maximize the benefits from both a, a more comprehensive system and also maximize the benefits derived from the support provided by multiple uh, donors or, or partners. And as these systems are rolled out more nationally, it's of course critical as well that stakeholders are involved, for instance, local communities that traditionally monitor their resources uh, by other means, and that the capacities at the local level are brought together with the capacities that are developed nationally, for instance, with the use of more sophisticated um, uh, technologies such as satellite remote sensing. Having a sound institutional framework for a national forest monitoring system is an absolutely essential ingredient to do this work effectively. So it's important that at the beginning of this process that strong institutions are designed and configured and an enabling environment and an enabling framework is being uh, created. The experience in many countries has been that uh, there has been a lot of support on forest monitoring system and MRV and a number of partnerships are operating uh, at the same time and cooperation happens both at the national level or project level and it can become very confusing. So 
bringing clarity to the institutional setup, bringing clarity to the role, roles and responsibilities is an important element to design the system and implement the system. It's also an essential element that national data sets that are oftentimes being collected by different parts of government institutions, sometimes through the context of projects, are uh, well in uh, coordinated and integrated, so they provide consistent information and it would be good practice that a high level technical committee at the national level oversees that, that process. Oftentimes the initial investments in a national forest monitoring systems also means the development of a data management system and the respective infrastructure, so servers and software and etc. And you will find more information about that in module 3.1. Given the multitude of activities that is often characterizing a specific country on, on these technical activities, it's important that communication mechanisms are established so that different subsystems or systems that are operated by different parts of government or being developed through donor support are well understood, that they all fit together. So talking to each other is an important part of this uh, if this work. So if you're just beginning this process, um, pay attention to this element as well. And it's uh, critical that all national stakeholders involved in the process, and these are not only the technical people, but also the policy people who um, represent the country internationally and make commitments on, on targets, for instance, they understand the cap uh, capa capacities and capabilities of their national uh, system. So it's, it's multiple national stakeholders They need to come together in this work and need to be communicated and convened effectively. And it can be very constructive, of course, if the local technical community as well as the international community in academia or centers of excellence within the country or in the region are leveraged and used to inform the design and implementation process. So again, important last point here is that this framework is essential to bring clarity to the roles and responsibilities of the various actors involved in the operation of a national forest monitoring system. So on the organizational capacity and institutional capacities, a couple of important pointers here, based on experience and a number of countries that have spearheaded this, it's very important to have a national coordination and steering body or an advisory board of sorts to, to guide this uh, this work, again, to have everyone focused on the, on the key tasks, not to perform redundant work, and, um, and have the technical work be performed in support of national policy direction. It's also important to clear, clarify what a central carbon monitoring um, entity is and who has the authority to, to, to measure, estimate and then report uh, emissions in the future. So I outlined uh, a number of important points on a technical and institutional capacity set up for National Forest Monitoring and NRED Plus. And as you will have seen, there were a couple of references to other modules uh, in this set of modules that will provide you a lot more detail and experience and also case studies to that effect. And now moving on to the fourth part of this lecture, the planning and implementation of the National Forest Monitoring System. And then I will wrap up with cost implications and cost considerations. At the beginning of the process, it's, it's very important to define the initial priorities for capacity building. For that, it's, it's uh, key, of course, to understand the national implementation strategy and the policies so that the technical work can be performed in harmony with the strategic and policy direction of the, the country. And it's important then to identify high priority areas to focus MRB 
oftentimes uh, what is useful in this, this case is to perform this in a stratified uh, fashion, focus on, on priority areas and, uh, and in, a, in a relative um, sense and, uh, and then build capacities on other perhaps less important areas later on. The practical experience in many countries, including those countries performing and be supported uh, by the uh, Ford Car Partnership Facility, is that early actions are often subnational, and part of the monitoring that becomes then important is the so-called displacement of uh, emissions or the leakage. So as you implement effective Red Plus policies at the national level, subnational level. The, the key drivers may be moving to other parts of the countries and cause emissions there. So oftentimes the monitoring system may have the task to perhaps not quantitatively but qualitatively track the, that effect. And of course the implementation of the monitoring system in some cases is also linked with the development of the benefit sharing mechanism so as Effective Red Plus implementation generates payments to countries. These payments will have to be targeted to certain areas through the benefit sharing mechanisms or arrangements agreed in the country and the, and the monitoring system and the results from that monitoring system can be useful to that effect. Now this is a very busy slide that shows you the basic process of how you establish a national monitoring system. So what I'd like to do in the next couple of slides is dissect this, this chart, which you can find in the GovC Gold source book, uh, and can study that in more detail. But basically the three portions of this have to do with uh, setting the objectives and the design features of the forest monitoring system. Then there's a couple of decision points with respect to the establishment of the forest monitoring system. And then, of course, the, the use for analysis and reporting of that system later on. So let me dissect these, uh, this graph a little bit and walk you through some of the key decision points as you establish a natural forest monitoring system. So on objectives and design, what you see here are some Key, key questions and depending what the answer to those questions is you, you may have certain capacity development uh, needs so for instance starting with the first question here which has, which has to do with the um, understanding of key relevant national stakeholders of the understanding of the requirements on MRV and national forest uh, carbon accounting you may have to if, if, if that understanding is limited, you may have to um, build some capacity and update people on the status of these negotiations, which have largely been concluded now at this time in 2017. You may have to bring uh, people up on the general carbon dynamics or the carbon cycle in the country and uh, or build some capacity on the requirements and the good practice guidance provided by the uh, IPCC. So these are the type of things, if, if the general understanding of the requirements is not good, um, if these have been established through some initial capacity building, uh, focusing on the institutional framework is an important associated next uh, question. So depending on whether that exists, you may have to focus on establishing and designing coordination mechanisms and clarifying the roles and responsibilities of the various actors involved in that monitoring system. So in this objective and design phase of the National Forest Monitoring System, it's, uh, you should, uh, um, that, that should result in, in a clear monitoring framework, and that framework should include things like the key definitions, the variables that are being monitored in the institutional framework. After this design uh, phase, you should also have a plan for capacity building development in place. So most likely there will be important capacity gaps to be filled and, and according uh, and the respective plan needs to be developed and implemented to close these gaps over, over time. And uh, that ideally is also accompanied by an estimation of costs to establish that uh, system. 
moving on to this, uh, the middle portion of this uh, decision tree or sequence of decisions that you would go through as you establish the National Forest Monitoring System. Um, and I'm not going to go into uh, great detail here. You could perhaps study this um, in more detail yourself by looking at the slides or reading up on the respective sections in the uh, Copsy Gold um, source book. But the basic question that we're starting with here is whether a national forest monitoring system is complete and accurate and, and ready for Red Plus implementation and reporting of uh, land use based um, emissions. If um, no, then you would have a number of technical uh, questions to answer and respective capacity gaps to be filled, which are shown on the right. So, in, for instance, if you have consistent multi date, multi temporal forest area change data, if not, you may have to invest in the acquisition and processing of satellite data at the respective capacities. Um, oftentimes, forest degradation is an important process in a country that leads to emissions. So that's, for instance, the third question down this, this tree. So if carbon changes in areas that remain forests are uh, significant, you may have to analyze that the process behind these um, uh, phenomena more clearly and to develop a, a, a monitoring capacity building plan accordingly. And lastly, just to pick another example here, uh, it's, a, it's, it's key also later for the assessment whether you know these sources and uncertainties associated with um, reported emissions and whether they can quantify it. In almost all countries that we've worked in, that I'm aware of. This expertise is, is not fully there and requires some associated uh, capacity building to that effect. And then lastly, moving into the monitor, uh, monitoring phase, uh, the, the establishment of, of the phase. So uh, it's uh, it's important that you use, uh, take advantage of existing observations and information that exists in a country, that you specify the methodology and operational implementation framework for monitoring of forest area changes at the national level. A first step often is to perform analysis to understand historical uh, patterns of emissions and that's where uh, records of satellite information become uh, very instrumental. Forest degradation, often a major driver of emissions in, in, in countries, need to be understood better and uh, the assessment and monitoring capacities that can be improved uh, are, are crit critical here as well. And oftentimes that implies that the teams and capacity need to be reinforced through recruitment and the provision of training to the national teams to perform the necessary monitoring functions. And last but not least is to also invest in the capacity to estimate the accuracies and errors associated with any emissions, either associated with foreign estimate changes or the um, estimates of forest uh, properties such as carbon density that needs to be focused on as well in order to provide reliable and credible emission reductions. And of course, learning by doing and, and, and implementing this, uh, this, uh, this system and using it is the best way of, of improving it and seeing whether it, it, it works. So these are some, some key steps as, as this monitoring system is established. And then lastly, of course, you want to get to a point where you can uh, credibly report on your estimated emissions. And again, here are a couple of decision points and questions that you would ask yourself in the design and implementation um, uh, process um, to, to see whether you are ready to report and whether you have all the variables that you need to be report on and whether the um, baseline has been reviewed and is sound and whether you have the expertise to report against that baseline.
going forward. Many countries have developed these road maps and uh, as part of this learning material you will find a number of examples. Here is an example for Ethiopia which went through this process a couple of years ago with the support of a number of uh, partners. And just to note the main elements of this roadmap. So first institutional arrangements were established, then there was initial focus on the improvement of activity data, but then also the improvement of national forest monitoring with respect to the stocks, um, carbon stocks, and emission factors, so-called emission factors. Um, there was uh, a phase of improvement in the estimation of uh, land use change and, um, and, and land cover change and the inventory and the reporting capacities. There was a preparation for MRV of Red Plus at the national level and there was a plan to implement a program for continuous improvement of uh, capacity development um, over some period of time and ideas to improve national and local communication around Red Plus monitoring. So these were elements that were put into the roadmap for Ethiopia and similar roadmaps were developed and then implemented by other countries. So if you're one of the countries that is at the beginning of this process, these are the kind of documents that would be useful reference. So this gets me to the last bit of this uh, lecture and that has to do with some of the cost implications. So many of these things that I've just gone through in the, uh, the first four uh, modules of this lecture of course very useful but they come at a cost both building capacity but also acquiring data and processing data has, has costs. So here I'm presenting a couple of important uh, considerations. The development of a national forest monitoring system of course requires resources and has costs. And there are different uh, cost categories that we often look at when we consider Red Plus uh, important category is the implementation costs of the actual actions that would result in emission reductions. But another category of costs has to do with so-called transaction costs, which are costs that you incur by transacting on the sale or the transfer of emission reductions uh, through a financial mechanism as it's envisaged, envisaged for Red Plus. So uh, measuring and reporting and having emissions verified is of course a transaction and that has costs that you only perform if you expect to receive finance and payments for these uh, these efforts. So, so MRV falls into this category of transaction costs, uh, generally speaking. And uh, the experience so far is that the resources for monitoring are relatively small compared to the overall cost of implementing Red Plus actions such as the protection of forests or the establishment of plantations or the improvements in land use planning. But at the beginning, or especially during the so-called readiness phase, the costs and initial investments in capacities and data and uh, some hardware and infrastructure can be quite uh, significant. That's why you see that many countries have spent and are spending a considerable amount of their available readiness resources on MRV, given that the initial capacities are relatively uh, low and the requirements are relatively high, but over time that uh, ratio is of course meant to change and the implementation costs for the actual activities to reduce emissions would become more uh, dominant and relevant. Numbers or general um, ideas on this in the next couple of slides. So one category of costs has to do with remote sensing and, uh, and those costs can arise from a number of factors uh, shown here. So the data itself can cost but increasingly uh, data becomes freely available uh, and oftentimes it's well uh, pre-processed already which saves you a lot of costs so that's often uh, information and data provided by
uh, space agencies, the European Space Agency or the, the NASA um, uh, Space Agency. So that's uh, a, a great advantage that many countries have now that the basic information and the data is already readily available and freely available in most, most cases. But in some circumstances, you may have to purchase certain data uh, to support your analysis. Software, hardware, and office resources are, of course, necessary to pro process data and um, analyze data. You need people to do that. And uh, you may need uh, to consider having operational costs uh, covered as well to run these systems um, sustainably over time. Accuracy assessment uh, is an important function and oftentimes requires some building of capacity and has associated uh, costs. And sometimes a regional cooperation or cooperation among different uh, stakeholders within the country has costs as well. Here's a table that you can uh, study in more detail by looking into the Govsi Gold source book, but it basically tells you that different categories of remote sensing data have different uh, kinds of costs and they have also different kinds of utility uh, for, for monitoring depending on whether they are characterized by coarse resolution. They can cover large areas but more frequently or whether they are having fine resolution and need to focus on smaller areas and have less frequent observation cycles. That may be quite useful to, to validate um, broader observations uh, collected by coarser um, and by also satellite sources. What you see here are some really indicative costs of monitoring and capacity building for REP plus uh, MRV. Uh, what is shown here are the capacity building costs in dollars per square kilometer. Uh, so the cost for monitoring and capacity building, I should say. On the left, you basically see that if you have pre-existing capacities, um, then the costs are lower relative to the situation where you start from a lower base. And what you can see on the right is that as you monitor over larger areas, the unit costs, so the capacity building and monitoring costs per square kilometer also uh, come down. So smaller countries tend to have, therefore, larger relative costs than larger countries that monitor over larger areas and therefore have some economies of scale in monitoring. This gets me then to the end of this lecture, so let me summarize with five key points that we learned throughout this uh, module. First, in order to effectively perform the functions of measuring, reporting, and verification for it plus, you need to have a operational force monitoring system, that's absolutely uh, essential. And you learned about the key functions and efforts that are necessary to establish this system in this lecture. Second, such a system has ideally, and in most circumstances, multiple functions and has diff different uh, elements. There are the more general monitoring functions to support uh, force management and management of natural resources more generally, including water or other land uh, resources. Uh, but you also draw on the same kind of observations and the same kind of uh, systems to perform the specific functions needed for Red Plus to measure and report and verify emissions uh, estimated and compared to a Red Plus reference emission level. Third, and that's a very important point, a strong and clear and transparent and well-resourced institutional framework is important uh, so everyone has clarity on their roles and functions with respect to this national forest monitoring systems and that there's clarity on the methods and the tools and the protocols used uh, throughout the system and uh, the clarity around the institutional responsibility roles and responsibilities is, is absolutely essential. Now, you, hear, you learn some uh, good points on, on this particular element. Fourth, developing a solid roadmap at the beginning of this uh, process is very important. It can guide you effectively through that process. Several countries have done that, and I've shown you references to countries that uh, did so. 
uh, you can learn a lot from uh, the experience in these other countries, but having a clear plan and a plan to implement uh, the necessary actions is, 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 is crucial. So you have eventually all the elements in place to effectively perform MRV functions with the National Forest Monitoring System. And this is a particularly important if you are someone listening from a country that is still at the beginning of this, uh, this process. We obviously have several countries that have gone through this process already quite uh, successfully, and those are the countries you can learn from. And lastly, all of this has uh, costs, both the capacity building, but also some investments in the hardware and the data that is uh, needed, as well as the knowledge exchange and the learning around these uh, systems. And uh, they can be quite significant at the beginning, so not surprisingly many countries at the beginning, in the phase one of this uh, process, invest a fair amount of time and resources to, uh, to do this and build the capacities that they ideally come down over time as the systems become operational and perform broader functions uh, as well and gain in efficiency. To check out some of the other modules in this series of uh, lectures, either recorded or unrecorded, let me just remind you that there's also country examples and exercises that go with each of these modules as shown on this slide. And as I mentioned throughout the lecture, there are several modules that most immediately and directly link to this particular one, uh, and they're shown on this uh, slide. So um, I will simply leave you with a couple of references. You will also find in the non-narrated version of this uh, lecture and that you can maybe follow uh, online or download um, from the resources provided on the Goxy Gold and FCPF website for further reading if you're so inclined. So with that, thank you and I hope uh, we'll see you soon again. Bye.